Morningstar, Book One, Twenty Nine Twenty, The Last Year of the First Era, by Karlovac Townwave. First Morningstar, Twenty Nine Twenty, Mournhold, Morrowind. Alma Alexia lay in her bed of four, dreaming. Not until the sun burned through her window, infusing the light with and flesh colors of her chamber. In a milky glow did she open her eyes. It was quiet and serene, a stunning reverse of the flavor of her dreams, so full of blood and celebration. For a few moments, she simply stared at the ceiling, trying to sort through her visions. In the courtyard of her palace was a boiling pool which steamed with the coldness of the winter morning. At the wave of her hand, it cleared, and she saw the face and form of her lover, Vivek, in his study to the north. She did not want to speak right away. He looked so handsome in his dark red robes, writing his poetry as he did every morning. Vivek, she said, and he raised his head in a smile, looking at her face across the thousands of miles. I have seen a vision of the end of the war. After eighty years, I don't think anyone can imagine an end, said Vivek with a smile, but he grew serious, trusting Almalexia's prophecies. Who will win? Morrowind or the Cyrodiilac Empire? Without Sotasil in Morrowind, we will lose, she replied. My intelligence tells me the Empire will strike us to the north in early springtide, my first seed at the latest. Could you go to Arteum and convince him to return? I will leave today, she said, simple. Fourth Morning Star 2920 Gideon Black Marsh The Empress paced around her cell. Wintertide gave her wasteful energy, while in the summer she would merely sit by her window and be grateful for each breath of stale swamp wind that came to cool her. Across the room, her unfinished tapestry of a dance at the imperial court seemed to mock her. She ripped it from its frame, tearing the pieces apart as they drifted to the floor. Then she laughed at her own useless gesture of defiance. She would have plenty of time to repair it and craft a hundred more. The emperor had locked her up in, the ca in Castle Giovess seven years ago and would likely keep her here until he or she died. With a sigh, she pulled the cord to call her knight, Zook. He appeared at the door within minutes, fully uniformed as befitted an imperial guard. Most of the native Kothringi, tribesmen of Black Marsh, preferred to go about naked. But Zook had taken a positive delight to fashion. His silver reflective skin was scarcely visible, only on his face, neck, and hands. Your Imperial Highness, he said with a bow. Zook, said Empress Tavia. I'm bored. Let's discuss methods of assassinating my husband today. Fourteenth Morning Star, 2920, the Imperial City, Cyrodiil. The chimes proclaiming South Wind's prayer echoed through the wide boulevards and gardens of the Imperial City, calling all to their temples. The Emperor, Raymond III, always attended a service at the Temple of the One, while his son and heir, Prince Juliac, found it more political to attend a service at a different temple for each religious holiday. This year, it was at the Cathedral Benevolence of Mara. The benevolences service were mercifully short, but it was not until well after noon that the emperor was able to return to the palace. By then the arena combatants were impatiently waiting for the start of the ceremony. The crowd was far less restless as the Ponte at the Versidiusiae had arranged for a demonstration from a troop of Kajiti acrobats. Your religion is so much more convenient than mine, said the emperor to his Ponte Tate by way of an apology. What is the first game? A one-on-one -on -one battle between two able warriors, said the Ponte Tate, his scaly skin catching the sun as he rose, arm befitting their culture. Sounds good, said the emperor and clapped his hands. Let the sport commence. 
As soon as he saw the two warriors enter the arena to the roar of the crowd, Emperor Raymond III remembered that he had agreed to this several months before and forgotten about it. One combatant was the Pontetate's son, Savirian Chorak, a glistening ivory yellow eel, gripping his katana and wakizashi with his thin, deceptively weak looking arms. The other was the Emperor's son, Prince Juliak, in ebony armor with a savage orcish helm, shield and longsword at his side. This will be fascinating to watch, is the Pontetate, a white grin across his narrow face. I don't know if I have ever seen a Cyrodiil fight an Akavir like this. Usually, it's army against army. At last, we can settle which philosophy is better. To create armor to combat swords, as your people do, or to create swords to combat armor, as mine do. No one in the crowd, aside from a few scattered Akaviri consulars and the Pontetate himself, wanted Saviri and Chorak to win. But there was a collective intake of breath and the sight of his, his graceful movement. His swords seemed to be a part of him, a tail coming from his arms to match the one behind him. It was a trick of counterbalance, allowing the young serpent man to roll up into a circle and spin into the center of the ring in offensive position. The prince had to plod forward the less impressive traditional way. As they sprang at each other, the crowd bellowed with the light. The Akaviri was like a moon in orbit around the prince, effortlessly springing over his shoulder to attempt to blow from behind, but the prince whirled around quickly to block with his shield. His counter-strike made only air as his foe fell flat to the ground and slithered between his legs, tripping him. The prince fell into the ground with a resounding crash. Metal and air melted together as Savirian Chorak rained strike after strike upon the prince, who blocked every one with his shield. We don't have shields in our culture, murmured Bersidushiae to the emperor. It seems strange to my boy, I imagine. In our country, if you don't want to get hit, you move out of the way. When Saviri and Chorak was rearing back to begin another series of blinding attacks, the prince kicked at his tail, sending him falling back momentarily. In an instant, he had rebounded, but the prince was also back on his feet. The two circled one another until the snake man spun forward, katana extended. The prince saw his foe's plan and blocked the katana with his longsword and the wakizashi with his shield. In short, its short punching blade impaled itself in the metal and Savirian Chorak was thrown off balance. The prince's long blade slashed across the Akaviri's chest and the sudden, intense pain caused him to drop both his weapons. In that moment, it was over. Saviria Chorak was prostrated in the dust with the prince's long sword at his throat. The game's over, shouted the emperor, barely heard over the applause from the stadium. The prince grinned and helped Saviria Chorak up and over to a healer. The emperor clapped his pontetate on the back, feeling relieved. He had not realized when the fight had begun how little chance he had given his son at victory. He will make a fine warrior, said Percy Dushiae, and a great emperor. Just remember, laughed the emperor, you Akaviri have a lot of showy moves, but it's just one of our strikes come through. It's all over for you. Oh, I'll remember that, nodded the Pontetate. Raman thought about the comment for the rest of the games, and had trouble fully enjoying himself. Could the Pondetate be another enemy, just as the Empress had turned out to be? The matter will bear watching. 21st Morningstar, 29.20, Mournhold, Morrowind Why don't you wear that green gown I gave you? asked the Duke of Mournhold, watching the young maiden put on her clothes. It doesn't fit, smiled Torala, and you know I like red. It doesn't fit because you are getting fat, laughed the duke, pulling her down on the bed, kissing her breast and the pouch of her stomach. She laughed at the tickles, but pulled herself up. 
wrapping her red robe around her. I'm wrong like a woman should be, said Turala. Will I see you tomorrow? No, said the duke. I must entertain Vivek tomorrow, and the next day the Duke of Evonhart is coming. Do you know, I never really appreciated Alma Alexia and her political skills until she left. It is the same with me, smiled Turala. You will only appreciate me when I'm gone. That's not true at all, snorted the Duke. I appreciate you now. Turala allowed the Duke one last kiss before she was out the door. She kept thinking about what he said. Would he appreciate her more or less when he knew that she was getting fat because she was carrying his child? Would he appreciate her enough to marry her? The year continues in Sun's Dawn. Sun's Dawn, Book 2 of 2920, The Last Year of the First Era, by Carlo Vactanway. Third Sun's Dawn, 2920, The Isle of Arteum, Somerset. Sotha Seal watched the initiates float one by one up to the awesome tree, taking a fruit or a flower from its high branches before dropping back to the ground with varying degrees of grace. He took a moment while nodding his head in approval to admire the day. The whitewashed statue of Syravain, which the great mage was said to have posed for in ancient days, stood at the precipice of the cliff overlooking the bay. Pale purple proscato flowers waves to and fro in the gentle breeze. Beyond ocean and the misty border between Arteum and the main island of Somerset. By and large, acceptable, he, proca he proclaimed as the last student dropped her fruit in his hat. With a wave of his hand, the fruit and flowers were back in the tree. With another wave, the students had formed into position in a semicircle around the sorcerer. He pulled a small, fibrous ball about a foot diameter from his white robes. What is this? The students understood this test. It asked them to cast a spell of identification on the mysterious object. Each initiate closed his or her eyes and imagined the ball in the realm of the universal truth. Its energy had a unique resonance as all physical and spiritual matter does, a negative aspect, a duplicate version, relative paths, true meaning, a song in the cosmos, a texture in the fabric of space, a facet of being that has always existed and always will exist. A ball, said a young North named Wildleg, which brought giggles from some of the younger initiates, but a frown from most, including so Basil. If you must be stupid, at least be amusing, growled the sorcerer and then looked at a young, dark-haired Altmerd lass who looked confused. Lilatha, do you know? It's... it's Grom, said Lilatha uncertainly. What the drew meth after the... they have... Carbonism? Carbonism, but very good, nonetheless, said Sotasil. Now, tell me, what does that mean? I don't know, admitted Lilatha. The rest of the students also shook their heads. There are layers to understanding all things, said Sota Sil. The common man looks at an object and fits it into a place in his way of thinking. Those skilled in the old ways, in the way of the psychic, in mysticism, can see an object and identify it by its proper role. But one more layer is needed to be peeled back to achieve understanding. You must identify the object by its role and its truth, and interpret that meaning. In this case, this ball is indeed Grom, which is a substance created by the Drow, in an underwater race in the north and western parts of the continent. For one year of their life, they undergo Carvinasm, when they walk upon the land. Following that, they return to the water and meth, or devour the skin and organs they need for the land dwelling. Then they vomit it up into little balls like this. Grom. Drow vomit. The students looked at the ball a little whistly. Sotasil always loved this lesson. Fourth, Sun's Dawn. 2920, the Imperial City, Cyrodiil. 
spice, muttered the emperor, sitting in his bath, staring at the lamp on his foot. All around me, traitors and spies. His mistress, Rija, washed his back, her legs wrapped around his waist. She knew after all these many years when to be sensual and when to be sexual. When he was in a mood like this, it was best to be calmly, soothingly, seductively sensual, and not to say a word unless he asked her a direct question, which he did. What do you think when a fellow steps on his Imperial Majesty's foot and says, I'm sorry, Your Imperial Majesty? Don't you think pardon me, Your Imper Imperial Majesty, is more appropriate? I am sorry. Well, that almost sounds like the bastard the Gonian was sorry I am his imperial majesty. Then he hopes we lose the war with Morrowind. That's what it sounds like. What would make you feel better? asked Grisha. Would you like him flogged? He is only, as you say, the battle chief of Solrest. It would teach him to mind where he's stepping. My father would have flogged him. My grandfather would have had him killed, the emperor grumbled, but I don't mind if they all step on my feet, provide they respect me, and don't plot against me. You must trust someone. Only you, smiled the emperor, turning slightly to give Grisha a kiss, and my son Juliet, I suppose, though I wish he were a little more cautious. And your counsel? And the Ponte Tate? asked Rija. A pack of spies and a snake, laughed the emperor, kissing his mistress again. As they began to make love, he whispered, As long as you're true, I can handle the world. Thirteenth, Sunstorm, 2920, Mournhold, Morrowind. Turala stood at the black, bejeweled city gates. A wind howled around her, but she felt nothing. The duke had been furious upon hearing his favorite mistress was pregnant and cast her from his sight. She tried again and again to see him, but his guards turned her away. Finally she returned to her family and told them the truth. If only she had lied and told them, she did not know who the father was. A soldier, a wandering adventurer, anyone. But she told them that the father was the duke, a member of the house Inderil and they did what she knew they would have to do, as proud members of the house brethren. Upon her hand was burned upon her hand was burned the sign of expulsion her weeping father had branded on her. But the Duke's cruelty hurt her far more. She looked out the gate and into the wide winter plains, twisted sleeping trees and skies without birds. No one in Morrowind would take her in now. She must go far away. With slow, sad steps, she began her journey. 16th, Sun's Dawn, 2920, Sanchao, Anekina, modern day, elsewhere. What troubles you? asked Queen Hasama, noting seeing her husband's sour mood. At the end of most lover's day, he was in an excellent mood, dancing in the ballroom with all guests. But tonight, he retired early. When she found him, he was curled in bed, frowning. That blaster bard's tale about Polydor and Eloisa put me in a rotten state, he growled. Why did he have to be so depressing? But isn't that the truth of the tale, my dear? Weren't they doomed because of the cruel nature of the world? It doesn't matter what the truth is. He did a rotten job of telling a rotten tale, and I'm not going to let him do it anymore. King Drossel sprang from the bed. His eyes were roomy with tears. Where did they say he was from again? I believe Gilverdale in easternmost Valenwood, said the queen, shaken. My husband, what are you going to do? Drossel was out of the room in a single spring, bounding up the stairs to his tower. If Queen Hazama knew what her husband was going to do, she did not try to stop him. He had been erratic of late, prone to fits and even occasional seizures, but she never suspected the depths of his madness and his loathing for the bard and his tale of the wickedness and perversity found in mortal man. 19th, 
Sans Don, 2920, Gilverdale, Valenwood. Listen to me again, said the old carpenter. If sell three holds worthless brass, then sell two holds the gold key. If sell one holds the gold key, then sell three holds worthless brass. If sell two holds worthless brass, then sell one holds the gold key. I understand, said the lady. You told me, and so sell one holds the gold key, right? No, said the carpenter. Let me start from the top. Mama, said the little boy, pulling on his mother's sleeve. Just one moment, dear. Mother's talking, she said, concentrating on the riddle. You said, sell three holds the golden key. If sell two holds worthless brass, right? No, said the carpenter patiently. Sell three holds worthless brass if sell two. Mama, cried the boy. His mother finally looked. A bright red mist was pouring over the town in a wave, engulfing building after building in its wake. Striding before was a red-skinned giant, the Dedra Molakbal. He was smiling. 29 Sun's Dawn, 29, 20. Gilverdale, Valenwood. Alma Alexia stopped her steed in the vast moor of mud to let him drink from the river. He refused to, even seemed repelled by the water. It stuck her a sword. They had been making excellent time from Moorhold, and surely he must be thirsty. She dismounted and joined her retinue. Where are we now? she asked. One of her ladies pulled out the map. I thought we were approaching a town called... Gilverdale. Alma Alexia closed her eyes and opened them again quickly. The vision was too much to bear, as her followers watched. She picked up a piece of brick and a fragment of bone, and clutched them to her heart. We must continue to our town, she said quietly. The year continues in First Seed. First Seed, Book 3 of 2920, The Last Year of the First Era by Carlo Vactuanwe. 15. First Seed, 2920. Caera, Suvio, Cyrodiil. From their vantage point high in the hills, the Emperor Raymond III could still see the spires of the Imperial City, but he knew he was far away from hearth and home. Lord Clavius had a luxurious villa, but it was not close to being large enough to house the entire army within its walls. Tents lined the hillsides, and the soldiers were flocking to enjoy his lordship's famous hot springs. Little wonder, winter chill still hung in the air. Prince Juliak, your son, is not feeling well. When Ponta Tatebersi de Oshiae spoke, the emperor jumped. How that Akavir could slither across the grass without making a sound was a mystery to him. Poisoned, I would wagger grumbled Remen. See to it that he gets a healer. I told him to hire a taster like I had, but the boy's head strong. There are spies all around us. I know it. I believe you're right, your imperial majesty, said Versi to Shire. These are treacherous times, and we must take precautions to see that Mor Morrowind does not win this war, either on the field or by more insidious means. That is why I would suggest that you not lead the vanguard into battle. I know you would want to, as your illustrious ancestors Revan Revan I, Rasalus Dor, and Revan II did, but I fear it would be foolhardy. I hope you do not mind me speaking frankly like this. No, not at Revan. I think you're right. Who would lead the vanguard then? I would say Prince Juliak if he were feeling better, replied the Akavir. Failing that, Storik the Pharaoh would with Queen Nagea of Riverhold, at left flank, and Warchief Ulakth of Mlimoth at right flank, Akajid at left flank, and an Argonian at right, round the Emperor. I never do trust beast folk. The Pontetate took no offense. He knew that beast folk referred to the natives of Tamriel, 
not to the Zayed B or Agavir like himself. I quite agree, Your Imperial Majesty, but you must agree that they hate the Dumbler. Ulak was a particular grudge after all the slave raids on his lands by the Duke of Mournhold. The Emperor conceded it was so, and the Pontetate retired. It was surprising, thought Remen, but for the first time the Pontetate seemed trustworthy. He was a good man to have on one's side. 18. First Seed 2920. Ald Erfaud. Morrowind. How far is the Imperial Army? asked Vivek. Two days' march, replied his lieutenant. If we march all night tonight, we can get higher ground as the Piriai tomorrow morning. Our intelligence tells us the Emperor will be commanding the rear. Storic of Faroon has the vanguard. Nagea of Riverhold at the left flank, and Ulak of Limoth at the right flank. Ulak, whispered Vivek, an idea forming. Is this intelligence reliable? Who brought it to us? A Breton, spy in the Imperial Army, said the lieutenant and gestured towards a young, sandy-haired man who stepped forward and bowed to Vivek. What is your name, and why is a Breton working for us against the Zero Deals? asked Vivek, smiling. My name is Cassier Whiteley of Dwinan, said the man, and I am working for you because not everyone can say he spied for a god, and I understood it would be, well, profitable. Vivek laughed. It will be, your information is if your information is accurate. 19th First Seed, 2920. Bodrum's Morrowind. The quiet hamlet of Bodrum looked down on the meandering river, the Priai. Pri 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 it was an idyllic site, lightly wooded, where the water took a bend around the steep bluff to the east with a gorgeous white flower meadow to the west. The strange flora of Morrowind met the strange flora of Cyrodiil on the border, and commingled gloriously. There will be time to sleep when you have finished. The soldiers had been hearing that all morning. It was not enough that they had been marching all night. Now they were chopping down trees on the bluff and damming the river so its waters spilled over. Most of them had reached the point where they were too tired to complain about being tired. Let me be certain, I understand. Let me be certain I understand, my lord, said Vivek's lieutenant. We take the bluff so we can fire arrows and spell down on them from above. That's why we need all the trees cleared out. Damming the river floods the plain below so they will be thrashing through mud, which should hamper their movements. That's exactly half of it, said Vivek approvingly. He grabbed a nearby soldier who was hauling off the trees. Wait. I need you to break off the straightest, strongest branches of the trees and whittle them into spears. If you recruit a hundred or so others, it won't take you more than a few hours to make all we need. The soldier warily did as he was bade. The men and women got to work, fashioning spears from the trees. If you don't mind me asking, said the lieutenant, the soldiers don't need any more weapons. They are too tired to hold the ones they have got. These spears aren't for holding, said Vivek, and whispered. If we try them out today, they'll get a good night's sleep tonight. Before he got to work supervising their work. It was essential that they be sharp, of course, but equally important that they be well balanced and tempered proportionally. The perfect point for stability was a pyramid, not the conical point of some lances and spears. He had the men hurl the spears they had completed to test their strength, sharpness, and balance, forcing them to begin on a new one if they broke. Gradually, out of sheer exhaustion from doing it wrong, the men learned how to create the perfect wooden spears. Once they were through, he showed them how they were to be arranged and where. That night, there was no drunken pre-battle carousing and no nervous neophytes 
stayed up worrying about the battle to come. As soon as the sun sunk beneath the wooden, wooded hills, the camp was at rest. But for the sentries. Twentieth First Seed, 2920, Bodrum, Morrowind. Miramor was exhausted. For last six days he had grumbled and hoard all night and then marched all day. He was looking forward for the battle. But even more than that, he was looking forward to some rest afterwards. He was in the Emperor's command at the rear flank, which was good, because it seemed unlikely that he would be killed. On the other hand, it meant traveling over the mud and waste the army ahead left in their wake. As they began the trek through the wildflower field, Miramor and all the soldiers around him sank ankle deep in cold mud. It was an effort to even keep moving. Far, far up ahead, he could see the vanguard of the army led by Lord Storic emerging from the meadow at the base of a bluff. That was when it all happened. An army of Dunmer appeared above the bluff like a rising dither, pouring fire and floods of arrows down on the vanguard. Simultaneously, a company of men bearing the flag of the Duke of Mournhold galloped around the shore, disappearing along the shallow river's edge where it dipped into a timbered glen to the east. Warchief Ulagth, nearby on the right flank, let out a bellow of revenge at the sight and gave chase. Queen Nagea sent her flank towards the embankment to the west to intercept the army on the bluff. The Emperor could think of nothing to do. His troops were too bogged down to move forward quickly and join the battle. He ordered them to face east, towards the timber, in case Warhol's company was trying to circle around through the woods. They never came out, but many men facing west missed it with the battle entirely. Miramor kept his eyes on the bluff. A tall Dunmer, his supposed must have been Vivek, gave a signal, and the battle majors cast their spells at something to the west. From what transpired, Miramor deduced it was a dam. A great torrent of water spilled out, washing Negea's left flank into the remains of the vanguard, and the two together downriver to the east. The Emperor paused, as if waiting for his vanquished army to return and then called a retreat. Miramor hid in the, ra in the rushes until they had passed by and then waited as quietly as he could to the bluff. The Morrowind army was retiring as well back to their camp. He could hear them celebrating above him as he padded along the shore. To the east he saw the Imperial army. They had been washed into a net of spears strung across the river. Nagea's left flank on Storic's vanguard on Ulkath's right flank. Bodies of hundreds of soldiers strung together like beef. Miramor took whatever valuables he could carry from the corpses and then ran down the river. He had to go many miles before the water was clear again, unpolluted by blood. 29th First Seed, 2920 Hegafe, Hammerfell You have a letter from the Imperial City, said the chief chief priestess, handling, handing the parchment to Corda. All the young priestesses smiled and made faces of astonishment, but the truth was that Corda's sister, Risha, wrote very often, at least once a month. Corda took the letter to the garden to read. Her favorite place, an oasis in the monochromatic sand-colored world of the conservatorium. The letter itself was nothing unusual, filled with court gossip, the latest fashions which were tending to which were tending to wine dark velvets and reports on the Emperor's ever growing paranoia. You are so lucky to be away from all this, wrote Risha. The Emperor is convinced that his latest battlefield fiasco is all the result of spies in the palace. He has even taken to questioning me. Rupka, keep it so you never have a life as interesting as mine. Korda listened to the sounds of the desert and prayed to Rupka the exact opposite wish. The year is continued in Rain's Hand. Rain's Hand, Book 4 of 2920, The Last Year of the First Era, by Carlo Bactanwe. 
Third Rain's Hand, 2920, Cold Harbor, Oblivion. So the seal proceeded as quickly as he could through the blackened halls of the palace, half submerged in brackish water. All around him, nasty gelatinous creatures scurried into the reeds. Bursts of white fire lit up the upper arches of the hall before disappearing, and smells assaulted him, rancid death one moment, sweet flowered perfume the next. Several times he had visited the Dedra princess in their oblivion, but every time something different awaited him. He knew his purpose and refused to be distracted. Eight of the more prominent Dedra princes were awaiting him in the half-melted, domed room. Asura, Prince of the Dusk and Dawn, Boethia, Prince of Plots, Hermamora, Mora, Dedra of Knowledge, Hirsin, the Hunter, Malakath, God of Curses, Maroon's Dagon, Prince of Disaster, Molag Bal, Prince of Rage, Sheogorath, the Mad One. Above them, the sky cast tormented shadows upon the meeting. Fifth Rain's Hand, 2920 the Isle of Arteon, Somerset. Sotha Seal's voice cried out, echoing from the cave. Move the rock. Immediately, the initiates obeyed, rolling aside the great boulder that, locked, that blocked the entrance to the dreaming cavern. Sotha Seal emerged, his face smeared with ash, weary. He felt he had been away for months, years, but only a few days had transpired. Dilatha took his arm to help him walk, but he refused her help with a kind smile and a shake of his head. Were you successful? she asked. The Tedra princess I spoke with have agreed to our terms, he said flatly. Disasters, such as befell Giverdale, should be averted. Only through certain intermediaries, such as witches or sorcerers, will they, al will they answer the call of man and mare. And what did you promise them in return? asked the Nord boy, well like. The deals we make with Tedra, said Sotha Sil, continuing on to Iachias's place to meet with the master of the Sishik Order, should not be discussed with the innocent. Eighth, Rain Sand, twenty nine twenty. The Imperial City, Tirodel. A storm belitted the windows of the prince's bedchamber bringing a smell of moist air to mix with the censors feel with burning incense and nerves. A letter has arrived, a letter has arrived from the Empress, your mother, said the courier, anxiously inquiring after your health. What frightened parents I have, laughed Prince Juliac from his bed. It is only natural for a mother to worry, said Savirian Sharak, the Pontetata's son. There is everything unnatural about my family, Akavir. My exiled mother fears that my father will imagine me of being a traitor, covetous of the ground, and is having me poisoned. The prince sank back into his pillow, annoyed. The emperor has insisted on me having a taster for all my meals as he does. There are many plots, agreed the Akavir. You have been aped for nearly three weeks with every healer in the empire, shuffling through like a slow ballroom dance. At least... All can see that you're getting stronger. Strong enough to lead the vanguard against Morrowind soon, I hope, said Juliet. Eleventh, Rain's Hand. 2920, the Isle of Artelm, Somerset. The initiates stood quietly in a row along the arbor loggia, watching the long, deep marble line trench ahead of them flash with fire. The air above it vibrated with the waves of heat. Through each student, though each student kept his or her face dirty and emotionless, as a true psychic should, their terror was nearly as palpable as the heat. So Thassil closed his eyes and muttered the charm for fire resistance. Slowly, he walked across the basin of leaping flames, climbing to the other side, unscathed. Not even his white robe had, had been burned. The charm is in intensified by the energy you bring to it. By your own skills, just as all spells are, he said. Your imagination and your willpower are the keys. There is no need for a spell to give you a resistance to air or a resistant resistance 
or a resistance to flowers, and after you cast the charm, you must forget that there is even a need for a spell to give you resistance to fire. Do not confuse what I am saying. Resistance is not about ignoring the fire's reality. You will feel the substance of flames, the texture of it, its, its hunger, and even the heat of it, but you will know that it will not hurt or injure you. The students nodded, and one by one they cast the spell and made the walk through the fire. Some even went so far as to bend over and scoop up a handful of fire and feed it, and feed it air, so it expanded like a bubble and melted through their fingers. Sotasil smiled. They were fighting their fear admirably. The chief proctor, Thargalith, came running to the outward arches. Sotasil, Almalexia has arrived on our town. Iaches has told me to fetch you. Sotasil turned to Targalith for only a moment, but he knew instantly from the screams what had transpired. The North lad, well, it had not cast the spell properly and was burning. The smell of scratched hair and flesh panicked the other students who were struggling to get out of the basin, pulling him with them. But the incline was too steep away from the entry points. With a wave of his hand, Sotasil extinguished the flame. Wellig and several other students were burnt, but not badly. The sorcerer cast a healing spell on them, before turning back to Dargalith. I'll be with you in a moment, and give Almalexia the time to shake the road dust from her train. Sothasil turned back to the students, his voice flat. Fear does not break spells, but doubt and incompetence are the great enemies of any spellcaster. Master Wellig, you will pack your bags. I'll arrange for a boat to bring you to the mainland tomorrow morning. The sorcerer found them Alexia and Iachesis in the study, drinking hot tea and laughing. She was more beautiful than he had remembered, though he had never before seen her so disheveled. Wrapped in a blanket, dangling her damp, long, black tresses before the fire to dry. At Stota Seal's approach, she leapt to her feet and embraced him. Did you see him all the way from Morrowind? He smiled. It's pouring rain from Skywatch down to the coast, she explained, returning his smile. Only a half a league away, and it never rains here, said Ia Jessis proudly. Of course I sometimes miss the excitement of Somerset, and sometimes even the mainland itself. Still, I'm always very impressed by anyone out there who gets anything accomplished. It is a world of distractions. Speaking of distractions, what's all this I hear about a war? You mean the one that's been blotting the continent for at least 80 years, master? Asked Sothasil amused. I suppose that's the one I mean, said the Achesis with a shrug of his shoulders. How is that war going? We will lose it, unless I can convince Sothasil to leave our town, said Armalexia, losing her smile. She had meant to wait and talk to her friend in private, but the old Altmer gave her courage to press on. I have had visions. I know it to be true. Sothasil was silent for a moment, and then looked at Iachesis. I must return to Morrowind. Knowing you, if you must do something, you will, sighed the old master. The Sishik's way is to not be distracted. Wars are fought, empires rise and fall. You must go, and so must we. What do you mean, Iachesis? You are leaving the island? No. The island will be living the sea, said the Achesis, his voice taking on a dreamy quality. In a few years, the mists will move over our town and we will be gone. We are consulars by nature, and there are too many consulars in Tamriel as it is. No, we will go, and return where the land needs us again. Perhaps in another age, the old Aldmer struggles to his feet and drained the last tip of his drink before leaving Sotasil and Amalexia alone. Don't miss the last boat. The year continues in Second Seer. I like those books. I really like those books. It's it's kind of like, um, like a compilation of a lot of uh, points of views. That's really good. I kind of like the, the, the format of the books. I'm looking forward to, to reading the other ones. There's like 12 volumes of that. Holy shit. It's taking me quite a while to get through them. Uh, but it's really, really interesting. I'm looking forward to that. So I hope everyone enjoyed that too. 
uh that's it for today i don't have much time to read books and stuff so i think i'm going to go buy four like first four volumes then the second four volumes and then the third four volumes so it would be like a three-part book series the 2920 series of books so look forward to that uh okay so that would be all for this video in particular so bye bye goodbye